Mad Hatter, the whole family. So uh, Thomas and Jill St. Thomas uh, joined us, and uh, it's a great conversation. Uh, their daughter Electra uh, makes a uh, an appearance, uh, and Tom, one of their partners, is uh, busy taking pictures and uh, uh, making noise in the background. So it's a general good time. Uh, enjoy. <laughs> All right, so uh, so we've got the Mad Hatter clan is essentially what's happening, right? Is that about right? That's we're, right. We're here. Yep, All right, we're here. We're and we've got and we've got uh, we've got Jill and we've got Thomas and we've got Tom and uh, not to be confused with Thomas and we've got Electra. Yep. Okay. Uh, Electra is uh, the most mature, I think, person in the room. Yes. Is that about right? That's what happens when children raise children. <laughs> the child becomes the adult. Indeed. Indeed. All right. So Mad Hatter, Jill Thomas, everybody knows. Uh, Jill St. Thomas, excuse me. Everybody knows uh, you. You're the one with the glasses. So if they didn't know the name and, they, and the company, now they absolutely know. They do. And you've got the sparkly ones. I think these might be my favorites. They're my favorites. Right. You know, these are the, the go-tos. Yeah. And uh, I'm noticing Michael, you, uh, Thomas. Michael Thomas, uh, Michael Thomas, of course, uh, one of our forefathers, Thomas, of course, uh, also, uh, accessorizes. You've got a, is it a bowler? Would you call it or? Yeah, it's a boiled wool bowler. Boiled wool bowler. Okay. Yeah, it's good. You know, it's, it just keeps things under taps. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed it does. Fair enough. So, uh, so when did Electra come onto the scene? You know, what, what, you're like 15 or 16 years old? No, she's, she's 10. 10. Right. Okay. But she looked at me as though I were a crazy person. You are a crazy person. Okay. There you go. There's Electra is making a, uh, making an appearance. Um, all right. So Mad Hatter coffee and tea, uh, I always like to identify what state uh, you are operating in. Uh, this is not an easy question when it comes to Mad Hatter. Jill, where are you on the map currently if we're in November of 2015? Well, currently we are in Colorado and Washington, and we are launching this month in uh, Portland next week uh -huh. and Vermont uh, the first week of December. Uh -huh. And we're hoping that by the end of the year, Nevada will launch. Uh -huh. We've already purchased everything and bags are done. We're just waiting to do the training. Uh -huh. And um, we're also looking at California. Uh -huh. um, so Nevada's done. California's on the way. California's on the way. Right. Who else is in the works? The, oh, Illinois. Uh -huh. Hawaii. Uh -huh. And then Maryland. But all these folks... So we're under contract on some degree, but yeah. this is the industry. Once it's legislated and then when we meet our partners and by the time it actually the product is actually on the shelf, it can take up to two years. Okay. So as far as uh, Colorado, Washington, uh, those you have product on shelves. Uh, and did we not say Arizona on purpose? We're not in Arizona. You're not in Arizona. Not yet. You physically are in Arizona sometimes. Sometimes yeah. we drive through. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, we'd like to be in Arizona. Are sure. you? And you're almost in Oregon, or you? Uh, the we launch next week. Launch next week. Yeah. Vermont is. Vermont is December, the first week of December. We Got launch. it. And then Nevada's after that. Yeah. And then Cal uh, California, Illinois, Hawaii, Maryland. Yeah. And so on and so yeah. on. That's right. I feel like you were just going to say something, Thomas. Well, yeah. I mean, these are each each launch takes a lot of time and consideration, and each state and each partnership is individual due to the legislation mm -hmm. and the uh and what they can and let us do uh -huh. because it's not your standard distribution every everything in many cases we can't even call it a licensing deal uh, how, how do you mean well, some legislation says that we aren't able to license our out-of-state brands within this legislated state so uh -huh. in a sense we are merely in, in in fact, we really are basically a consulting and marketing company when it comes to beverages and infused products. Uh -huh. We happen to own one. It may not be in your state with our label on it, but right. it is our product. It is your product. Uh, it is not necessarily licensed. Uh, you have consulted the product into the market. Depending on the state and right. what verbiage they allow. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. 
So which one of you is the lawyer? Because I'm not looking at a lawyer, I don't think. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not. We do have a good lawyer. But, but, you know, the thing is, is, it's just, it's the creative prowess. Yeah. And I think that's what's really enabled us to go further than some of the other companies that are out there. Uh -huh. is that we're, we're not afraid to be outside of the box. Uh -huh. And we're not afraid to just say, there's got to be a workaround. Okay. There's definitely a workaround. How can we do this? Right? Okay. So even in states where they're not allowed to use branding, mm -hmm. they're not allowed to license anything, mm -hmm. all they have to have is a white package, we're still being called in to bring our products in. Uh -huh. So there are workarounds. I mean, mm -hmm. even if you're not after the brand, but you're after a really good product, yeah. people are still calling us in to bring our products Yeah, our in. motto is not to say no to anybody that wants to bring it to their state. And, and we kind of see how legislation is toothy in the beginning. And then it lightens up once people get used to it. Sure. And yeah. eventually, I think these white labeled brand states will let us bring our brand in a couple of years or whatever. And exactly. We'll already be there anyway. So. You're already there. Exactly. It's just a matter of packaging. Yeah. Um, okay. So so let's go, uh, I guess, all the way back to the beginning of Thomas and Jill so that we can get some context as to how this all kind of came together, what the history here is, because what we say is who you are informs what you do. Mm -hmm. So as a couple, when did this whole thing start? What year was it? Uh, we don't even know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's believable. It was either 89 <laughs> or, or 90. I think it was the September of 89. <laughs> we okay. can't quite put our finger on it. And this is, I was it in the village of uh, New, New York, York City? City? Yeah. Okay. West Village. Yeah. Uh-huh. And which one of you got there first? I was there first. Oh, okay. And where are you from originally? New Jersey. Okay. So that you were close enough. Yeah. And then where are you from originally? I'm from uh, San Diego, North County. That is not close to the village. No. no. It's not okay. Close. How did you get to the village? Well, I'm, I was a painter. I'm a still, I'm an artist, a painter. Right. And Soho was destination. So. Yeah. And, but I was working with a designer and we we're doing work. She was doing leather goods. And so I was helping her out with some of my things. And she knew if she her ex boyfriend's mom was best friends with Jill's mom. Oh wow! And so hey, when you're in New York, look up Jill. She'll tell you what clubs are hip and whatnot. Yeah. And so we did. All right. So what clubs were hip? Let's set the scene here. Late '80s Village. What are we talking? We're talking about CBGB, right? Oh, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But. Um, the club that we met, I mean, that I took him to yeah. the night that we actually met, the oh. first night we met, was called Brothers, and it was a soul, it was called the Soul Kitchen, Brothers Soul Kitchen, and okay. it was actually a restaurant during the day. Like and an, an ogre joint. And an illegal club at night, and awesome. it was right down the street from where I lived, which is across from the Film Forum on Houston. Okay, okay, right there. Yeah, right there. So um, the Soul Kitchen was basically on the corner of... What's, what is that? It's uh, Varick. Right. So it was like Varick and Houston. Yeah. And uh, the night that we went, after we left, they got busted by yeah, the fire department. Fire department threw everybody out. That was <laughs> and that was the end of what that What did you do? What did you do? <laughs> that place was so cool. All right. So he's an artist. He's painting. And what are you doing in the village at that time? So I was in a band called The Water Lilies. Uh -huh. I was the lead singer. And um, my music partner was also living in the city at the time. Yeah. And we were a local New York band at the time. And I guess we were releasing our... We had just released it? Just got signed with uh, Sire. Yeah, okay. just signed to Sire. Sire, Sire yeah. Is that uh, the the guy? Um, oh, what's his name? Isn't that the Seymour. guy? What's that? Seymour Stein. Stein. Seymour Stein. Yeah. Right. And his okay. wife, the real estate mogul, she yeah. was found dead, or I guess her maid killed her, or something. Her maid <laughs> beat her with her own cane. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Many many years later. Interesting. But Seymour the was nanny. Seymour was amazing. Like he signed <laughs> the nanny Madonna. Did. Yeah. He signed Madonna. He right. signed Depeche Mode. He's, he had such. Giant roster of Sire Records is like New York artists oh, yeah. without question. Yeah. One of the one of the greats. Yeah. So Water Lilies, who were you playing around town with? So what other bands? What were, other bands? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh gosh, I mean it was a mishmash because you know CBs there'd be twenty bands a night. Sure. So got to get them in, yeah, Hilly, right? I mean, there were a lot of bands, <laughs> but um, the Water Boys we were really friendly with. Book of Love we were very very friendly with. Okay. We shared a recording like studio space with them in Little Italy for a while. Yeah. Um, Tom Tom Club was really big. Okay. Um, gosh, who am I leaving out? B fifty two. The B fifty twos were huge. Wow. Well, that's a big one right there. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it was that was that whole that one that big record you know with the roof 
you know, Tin Roof. Tin Roof. That was that album. That that time period, anyway. Right. Wait. So that's after Rock Lobster. They're playing at CBGBs now. Oh yeah, they were still playing around. Oh, oh really? They did everything. Oh sure. That, that was the care. beauty of CBGBs. Yeah. It was somebody's. It was a living room. They yeah. could drop Anybody in. would come in and play unrecorded material or stuff they're working on, and you yep. could see you could see art, you know, awesome artists, just so low key, yeah. Yeah. five feet away from. Me. Sure. Yeah. yeah. CBGB's, uh, I have a uh, picture of CBGB's empty uh, with just a, a big garbage can uh, at the entrance of my apartment. There you go. <laughs> Delight was really big at that time, too. Delight, yeah, yeah of course. Delight, they were really big. I, when I think of the 90s, that's what the 90s sounds like right. to me. Yeah. But the Water Lilies... Uh, for cripes sake, that's with a P, uh, <laughs> you had a Farging number one thing. We did, yeah. Oh, my God. Three top ten hits. What there. happened? How did this happen? <laughs> so you're on Sire Records, so that's a good place to start. Well, we what, slept with the right people. Indeed. Indeed. Obviously. So <laughs> what, did you meet Seymour Stein? What, how did the Sire Records thing happen, and then how did the number one stuff happen so that we can get back to cannabis eventually? Yeah, no, Seymour did sign us. Okay. And... Um, we were brought to his attention by one of the members of Ocean Blue. Of Ocean Blue. Okay. A um, man from Pens Hershey, Pennsylvania. Yeah, right. Steve Wyatt was Steve. his name. All right. He was awesome, and he was working his way up with the label to create right. his own label. So he had he got a couple points on their deal. Yeah. But hey, get in the right room with the right people, and that's how it works. That's how it works. Yeah. Yeah. So Seymour signed us. We were going to go with TVT Records. Do you remember? Sure. That? Yeah. They stuck around for a while, They actually. did, yeah. and they went bankrupt shortly after, and we didn't go there. But, right. Um, we had looked at them as well, but uh -huh. um, Sire seemed to be the right home for us. So you signed with them, and then how quickly do you make your way up the charts? I think it actually took us a while to get our first record out. I think it was two years. Okay. And that was because we ha we did everything ourselves. Everything was actually recorded in this kitchen that was about the size of your bathroom. Uh-huh. In, a, you know, this really shabby railroad apartment, basically, in, well, I mean, everything's so different Chelsea. now. In yeah. Chelsea, but, right. I mean, it's not Chelsea, today's Chelsea then. Right. I mean, it Chelsea was creepy. Was, yeah. Chelsea was not yeah. a boutique Chelsea. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we did everything in-house, and then we would just bring everything to master. Okay. So it took us two years, because once we finished our first album, of course, we handed it in, they're like, oh, well, let's get... This, you know, let's get this group to remix it for you, blah, blah, blah. So uh, it was a big standoff. So right. we had to fight for that. Yeah. And um, then we finally released it two years later. So it was two years. So like 91? Yeah. All right. Yeah, it must be. And the the song that, that uh, kind of went up? Um, Sunshine Like You was our first top 10 hit. Okay. Yeah. And then? And then we had Tempted. Uh-huh. And never get enough. And so then, and the never get enough is the one that I know. I think in my mind, right? Probably. Yeah. And so then, now are you touring uh, outside of New York? And what kind of rooms? What size rooms? Oh, we were doing large clubs like, at that time, like the Palladium. Okay. And, you know the larger, larger nightclubs, right. several thousand capacity. That awesome kind of thing. So it was it was pretty cool. Plus we were doing like the Cat Club, and Limelight was still alive at that time. Oh my God! Yeah. Club America. Do you remember that club? I don't remember that. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. So there were a bunch of things, but it was mostly localized, and then we went on our first first tour. All right. So okay, and what was, was across the country? What were uh, some of the uh, best audiences? Um, the House of Blues was a really good Where? audience in Los Angeles. Okay, yeah, sure, right that there, that, very good. on Sunset, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That was a really good group, and then when we went on tour, we played in. Houston, yeah, and we didn't think we were gonna like Texas at all. Yeah, man, we love Texas. That rock. There we go. So that was kind of a that was a really nice standout crowd as well. And then what are you doing this whole time while she's on the road doing her rock and roll thing? You know, I'm playing the Yoko. I'm just trying to break them up. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you visit on the road or did you stick around in, in uh, well, Manhattan? Some, some tours I was I was there, and other uh. tours I I wanted to make painting, so I was. I was better off somewhere else, but yeah, yeah, no, I was available to be supportive. Cool. You know, and what, what painters were you hanging around with in, uh, in the village? Any, anybody we might know? No, I hate artists. <laughs> <laughs> Rather hang around musicians, I guess. Right? Exactly. Pretty ones. <laughs> No, you know how it is when you make art. You kind of just hole up in a wall, in a room, and right. you do your thing. And then as soon as you step outside, you forgot you even did it. Yeah. 
So it's, I can. I, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't think no, I've ever. It's, uh, a, it's an odd relationship. Yeah. Making art and then being an artist and then. You know, it's very hermetic. Marketing art. I, mean, it's, I, I never really marketed my own work. I always had dealers and whatnot. So. Right. It was easier for me just to detach from the whole artist persona because I'll tell you what, it's like making art, you kind of get involved in a whole different, you get corrupted by energy and you don't even remember it. Like a, a day can go as quick as a minute and it's all about making them hate. It's, you get wrapped up. Right. It's like you're in rapture in a sense. Got it. So that's what you're saying. There is the, I am painting. But I like many artists. Okay. But I just, you know, trying to get to their show. And a lot of, Social, artists, a lot right. of artists never even go to their shows yeah. in New York. Yeah. Like the, dealer, the artists you want to meet, they're not going to go to that show. Right. Okay. Like, you know, they're hanging out at, what was the big place? Like the, anyway, and it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> so you, essentially, as an artist, you were in the room painting and then not. It's basically, it didn't, you weren't caught up in the social scene of art in, in uh, New York. It doesn't no, sound like. No, yeah. I didn't really get caught up that much. Okay. In, in riding that, you know, that uh, social train society yeah. thing. Yeah. You know. All right. Uh, but what we did do is we rode our bikes through New York a lot, mostly yeah. all night. We would ride bikes. And we'd do this thing where we'd go with the green. Yeah. You know, we'd leave the apartment. And whatever green light directed us to that direction, we'd just keep going to That's that. awesome. That's and it would just take us throughout the whole city unknowingly huh. where we would go. And we just go with the green. Uh, that does remind me of when John met Yoko. He walked up the ladder and saw yes instead of no. And it's kind of like the green light and tying it all back together with you being a painter and calling yourself Yoko. Oh, I like that. Hey, we're still going with the green. <laughs> so is FedEx. Still to this day. Yeah. As we go. I think FedEx does too. Indeed. <laughs> 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 so, so anyway, uh, so, all right. So then that's the kind of early nineties. And I would imagine at a certain point that subsides, right. And then when did you kind of, uh, turn away from the music and turn towards the next thing? Um, well, when we were getting ready to release another, we were still on our second album. We had had a number one already. We had two, three top 10 hits, but we we're getting to release another single, and my music partner decided to call it quits. Because? Because he was agoraphobic, and he just could not stand leaving, and going on tour was frightening for him. Mm. And he just had issues like that that were hard for him socially. Yeah. So it was you, sort you of know like torture. Can, you know what can solve that? Uh, some strains of cannabis. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, you're right. <laughs> and he did, he yeah. did try to medicate. He did. Yeah. yeah. But when you get so far from home, and, you know, yeah. you break down. It was tough. It, it was really hard for him. Got it. So, um, so that pulled me out of the music industry, although I continued to write my own things. Mm -hmm. Um, we then moved across the country and went to California. Uh -huh. Which part? NorCal, SoCal? San Diego area. Okay. Yeah. All right. So back kind of home ish. Yeah. I still, we still, I still had rented a house there. I still had a place there and I subleased it to a, to a nice Christian couple. And then I get an email and I, this was before email. I got a call and said, Hey, all your stuff's in the yard. All my stuff's in the yard. Uh -huh. I'm back. So they were like cooking meth. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, yeah. So sure. We, we rushed back. To, and But prior to us coming back, her mom moved out there knowing that I still had a house there. And that she preempted she, us. She always wanted to be near us. I so. see. So she moved uh, towards you before you got there. She moved, what, five miles from where his yeah, house was. Where I grew up. Oh, wow. She just located herself okay yeah she all right so there's the clan there and, and and you get to san diego and then if you're moving away from uh you know music but still writing your own stuff but what what was the next thing and what year are we at so we're probably in around 94 92 somewhere in yeah. there right oh so it's mm -hmm. quick okay good it's fast yeah and my mother passes away she oh she has cancer oh she gets cancer and is diagnosed within, what, a year of living in California? Just yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. And she lived for a year longer, so she had two years out there, basically. So mm. she was just completely normal, fine, had just separated from her second husband mm. and was just starting to have sort of a life of her own. And she gets diagnosed with stomach and bone cancer. And they give her three months to live. Right. So, um, so we become her caregivers because we're there. The rest of the family is all... On the East Coast, I'm sure you know, Seth, I yeah. mean, no one from New Jersey and New York think that they can cross the Mississippi nope. without a passport. Exactly. So they don't come. Not to live. No. So um, so we were her caregivers, and right. we spent that time with her and wrapping all of that up. And then yeah. it was about reinventing 
again. Well, that's the that's whole how thing. the uh, coffees and teas basically medicated her so she would have not nausea. Right. So she would have, be able to eat. Yeah. And that was our first little Foray. investigation. Yeah. How did you find it? How did you find the coffees, the teas, and the, the solutions that you were giving her? How did, how did that come about? Well, she wasn't really used to smoking. Right. You know, she was part of a generation that it was like, what? I'm not going to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's easier to take a pill. Mm -hmm. So, but the pills weren't helping her nausea. And with stomach cancer, she literally couldn't digest anything. Right. So uh, nausea was just full time. Mm. And the cannabis was the only thing that could help her. So you knew it had to be kind of a tea. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, eventually she was smoking as well. I okay. Mean, you know, she was dying. She was terminal. Right. So there was a lot that we were trying to cover pain wise and mm -hmm. things like that. And did she get some uh, kind of uh, uh, relief? She did. Right. Absolutely. She really did. Right. Yeah. And of course, it wasn't legal. Mm -hmm. So. Well, it still yeah. isn't in California, kind of. Exactly. We do have AB 266, which is great. Yeah. And um, we're taking steps, and yeah. we got a ballot in issue 2016. Exactly. But, uh, okay, so your caregivers and your. Uh, Finding solutions for pain management and uh, giving your mother some relief. Unfortunately, she does pass away, and I'm sorry. Right. Thank you. Um, but then, what what is the next step? You said that there's a, a reinvention there. What what happened? Yeah. Well, there's a reinvention there. Self. You know, we had to look in ourselves for a little while. But then mm -hmm. we went into the we went into the art industry. Mm -hmm. Head board. We started managing art galleries and basically putting it on the board to create our own gallery and okay. that's where we moved to next. Yeah, we started curating spaces and then we became board members for different galleries and we were in San Diego and it just wasn't working on a commercial level. Mm. We weren't able to sell any art. Okay. And so we were like, if you're a gallery, it's something you need to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, and it's a, it was very sad because there were so many good artists Yeah. and we, we really just like, what are we doing with this? Mm. So I guess we went to a party in Palm Springs and we met a collector who invited us out to his ranch in Santa Fe County. Okay. New Mexico. Yeah. Right. So we went out there for a 4th of July party and I sold some of my work. But what was really cool about the the area was there's such open space, right? right? And we came across this little ghost town that was selling an old an accountant's house and I'm like, well, maybe we could open a gallery here just for fun. Because Santa Fe, people like to buy its art there. Yeah. And it wasn't a big contemporary art space. but So we thought there would be a niche for contemporary work. And there was. So we put in a bid on a house, and the guy shut down the bid. And uh, like a whole year goes by. And we're this time now we're in South Beach hanging out. And we get a phone call from the realtor saying, hey, that guy actually wants to accept your bid now. A year later. A year later. And she was like, Throw on another thirty grand because he's such an asshole and it took so long. <laughs> <laughs> and he Electra, did. You you owe Electra a dollar. Is what happened? <laughs> the guy agreed. All right. Okay. But, but it was a total ruin. I mean, it was a beat up old mining shack. But so we threw some time and money into it and moved out there. Yeah. And created a pretty awesome space for contemporary art. Great. And that took up three or four, five, six years. Yeah. Uh, and we so were, that one worked. Yeah, yeah that one worked. And we worked. traveled yeah. with that. We brought the work to New York. We mm. did art fairs. We did the whole thing. Yeah. We even did a bed and breakfast that was called the Art Hotel. That was you would oh, come cool. and stay, meet the artist, you'd stay with the work. You know. The I, I want to go there now. That's such a good idea. <laughs> well, now we can add cannabis to the menu. Indeed. You know I mean? That would be the idea. Yes. Right. Art and cannabis. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that was five, four, five, six years. Santa Fe is a really healing place, and I think we needed to heal yeah. after watching. Peggy died. Yeah. It, it was intense, actually. Yeah. And so there it was, and we moved out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, seriously, a ghost town. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm. I mean, there weren't even a million people in the state. Yeah. And in the Mexico state? Mexico is gigantic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we've had more people in you know our apartment complex in New York than the whole town yeah. that we live in. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, it's frightening. <laughs> and and like it's that is fact and amazing. Uh huh. Uh, and so all right. There was a little town. There was like there was a little newspaper. And they wanted to interview us, and they oh my God. they were like, well, we don't really know what to ask. Right. But why don't you write your own story? So we were just flipping. We're like, well, I retired from the IRS, and Jill's <laughs> working for the DEA, and sure, we did. We wrote this whole story. We thought it'd be a joke. We're right. St we're starting, you know, the San Diego San. 
Santa Fe County Young Republican Recruiting oh my Club. God, Come just... on over for Sunday Salon Cocktail Hour. <laughs> Nobody came. And they printed it. They printed it. Nobody came. And no one came. No one came. <laughs> the town didn't know what to do with us. So, like, a couple weeks later, a little knock on the door. I can't believe what they wrote about me. <laughs> like, oh my Where'd goodness. they get all that stuff anyway, right? <laughs> so, that kind of sabotaged our social life there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so, I got gotcha. you. It was a joke. Yeah. It was totally uh, a joke. Which, which they took very seriously. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, so then let's get to the cannabis. When, when does cannabis come into it? You know, you had at least a flash with coffees and teas and then, you know, still with art. And then when, when did that come back in? So, in 2007, okay. we technically started Mad Hatter Coffee and Tea. Technically, because. And it was because. the end of the year. Right. So, I mean, we came up with the idea. We approached, we basically did like a rough marketing research, you know, where yeah. we called a bunch of dispensaries and said, would you be interested in buying coffee with cannabis in it? And they're all, yeah. Why not? So, we, you know, if that was in the end of November, yeah. it wasn't until like, the middle of January, where we actually had the product in our hand. 2008. So, what so states? 2007, we started doing the marketing research, yeah. had the name, knew we were going to do it, but right. we still needed to create the product yeah. and get the brand and the logo together. Right. So it took us like two and a half months to figure all that out. Okay, 2008 to Colorado? Is that yes, what it was? to Colorado. And were you living in Colorado? No. Well, yes, of course you were yes, living in Colorado. Yes, no, what, we, what kind of no, question was that? We were not. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but it's okay yeah. because uh, I was born there. <laughs> yes, and they hadn't yet. We were putting out coffees and teas prior to their legislating the right. license to do so. Yeah. So when we actually conducted, applicated for the license, we did another little loophole where we brought in another court, you know, board member. Who has residence? Who there we go. Actually, this is what happened: is 2010 they legislated in Colorado. Indeed, we've we were heard. there in 2007, yes. 2008. Right. Okay. Right. So um, you went and you you brought your application and all of your five years of tax returns and bank statements and mm -hmm. all of that stuff um, to the 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 racetrack, which is Greyhound where the Greyhound racetrack, racetrack right. which is where they had their temporary offices. Uh -huh. And. At that point, everyone knew that residency was going to be a deciding factor on the application. However, yeah. they had not written the exact definition of what a resident was yeah. prior to the application being accepted for the deadline. Got it. So you still had to pay your money. You still had to put your application in, and no one knew what the definition of a resident even was. Okay. Was it a year? Mm -hmm. Was it six months? Mm -hmm. Was it two years? Mm -hmm. Was it a tax return? Who knows? Yeah. So it was a very vague and like, how could they do this? I mean, how can you ask some people to meet a deadline and not even tell them what all the definitions and the rules are? Oh, they're they right. uh, they're doing it today. Oh, I know. <laughs> so I know. So uh, so uh, so you you're in the marketplace. You start uh, selling into dispensaries. And what are in 2008? Uh, what are some of the kind of uh, first bits of feedback that you're receiving about the product? Thomas was the on the ground guy. Okay. I was the caller. So yeah. I was a sales rep. Got it. And he was the one that would be like in the store, not letting you say no. So he can answer that best. Yeah. What were people saying? Well, you know, I don't remember actually. <laughs> <laughs> it was too big of a sell. So Fair yeah. enough. So 2007, 2008. Okay. We're no, in. We rolled. We rolled it out. I mean, yeah. we saw the business grow. And yeah. I, I, I had a mission to go into almost every dispensary I thought was deemable. And I got on. I had a really beautiful motorcycle at the time. And okay. I, what was the make there? It was a BMW R C twelve hundred. Okay. Beautiful. The James Bond motorcycle. Excellent. Beautiful bike. Yeah. And I would hit the mountain mountain, you know, there's ski resorts and all of I wanted to go into every one. Yeah. And meet everybody. Yeah. And I thought I could do that. Yeah. And the bike was the fastest way to do it. And that's what I got. I I, I got that our Product isn't for everybody mm -hmm. because not everybody even drinks coffee mm -hmm. or then, tea. And that's where a gourmet, you know, organic product. It's kind of it's, it's a higher end, so not everybody can afford it. Yeah. Plus, and, let's also remember that edibles were only, were less than ten percent of the market share right. at the time. It we, was all smoke and only right. smoke. Right. We, so we had this much of the pie to deal with in the first place. That's why we were super, you know, proactive with all our testing and all our labeling on our products because we wanted to educate people on what 
it was that they were going to have. Back then, you were uh, forward thinking on packaging. Let's tell them everything. Well, that's what it really was. It was coming out of a need to educate the consumer, which was new to the market. Yeah. And so we basically spelled it out for them before anybody asked us to yeah. do so. We may have created the first dosage label for an edible product. Excellent. We, we decided to lab test because a lot of the dispensaries are like, people are so afraid to take an edible. You know, they did one in college and they don't want to be stoned for two days. Yeah. So we lab tested before that was ever required. A thing, right. And then we we're like, all right, well, if we're going to lab test, we need to tell them we're lab testing. So yeah. then we created a label on our own yeah. that had the Colorado flag on it, proudly made in, blah, blah, blah. Please keep away from children and pets. I mean, we basically hit every everything they're asking for now. You're doing that 2008. I was going to say, this <laughs> 2015 is I when know. everybody's catching up. That's amazing. We pretty much wrote the label. Yeah. 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 Okay. And we see it even, even the proudly in California or proudly in Colorado, that's all been adapted from our packaging. And, mm -hmm. and instead of curmudging, it's like, yeah, just make it, do it with pride. That's right. right. Do right. it with pride. Proactive. Do it. Yeah. And it's a, a, it feels like you know that uh, that is for the patient, that is for the consumer. And so what would we be curmudgeons about, right? Right. If, it, if, well, the, if the end goal is to educate. That's right. Exactly. Well, in a sense, you're like, this is my IP, why are you putting my stuff on your label? But right. you look at the person, that person's like been working all day, doing the same thing you're doing. It's like, of course, huh. do it. Because this, this, is, this is how it's going to be. So yeah. you might as well do it today. Right. That's it. That's exactly it. So you mentioned the, the percentage of the market as far as edibles to smoke, uh, 2009, 2010. Uh, take us through the trajectory and where that changed. Well, it changed as soon as Recreational was launched. Okay. I mean, it had been catching up. It was definitely catching up. I'd say it was probably in the 30, 35 percentile prior right. to 2009, 10, launched. 11, 12. Yeah, it was growing. It was growing pretty steadily. Mm -hmm. But um, once Rec launched, it just changed the whole game. I mean, now it's like 75% of the market share. Yeah. So it's it's just a completely different ball when game. You didn't have to go in and say you had a pre-consisting condition to get a medical marijuana card, basically outing, basically negating any insurance, whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. That's well, that's why I kept the numbers of the card membership down. I mean, the uh, patient count. Yeah. Because nobody wanted to, like slay their own ox right. themselves, right? right? As soon as you could just, so after recreation came in, and so many people who did not need to out themselves discreetly went in and bought an edible. Yeah, so it went from a third to three quarters, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Almost so, overnight. Right. I mean, that, that was the giant growth. Well, December 31st to January 1st, And I must say that, that even recreational, with the launch of recreational, I, I believe with our numbers that the med side grew as well. Okay. Yeah. So well, our med side grew yeah. at least 20% upon the launch of recreational. What do you figure. think that that is, means? Uh, what What do you think happened there? What is that, uh, you know? Well, I think that there's a level of taboo being, being broken down. So if it if it's legal for anyone over the age of 21, then why isn't it okay for me to get this as a medication? So that uh, kind of, I don't want to slay my own ox thinking goes out the window because everybody's doing it anyway. Everybody's, right. Yeah, you know. and people are bringing it and sharing it. And then, and then the higher doses are only available in the medical. Right. Yeah. So if. That's where you'd have to go. You have to go there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, 2014, uh, and then we've got the seismic shift in, in you know, how edibles are uh, consumed. Uh, where does Washington, when does Washington come in for you guys? We've had Washington for two years. Okay. Two and a half years. So 2013-ish? Yeah. yeah. It's probably three years now. Three years. It's okay. three years now. When did you know, and how did you know, and why did you know to go to Washington? They approached us. Who? Okay. The, the licensees in Washington approached us, uh -huh. as is the case most of the time. Mm -hmm. And um, they basically just said, we love your brands. We love what you're doing. You know, we love that you have a real medical product, a product that's thoughtful and has, you know, really good benefits to it. And um, we want to, we wanna, you know, launch it medically here in Washington. So right. we worked with them. And, of course, you know that the medical side in Washington just was hideously slaughtered. So <laughs> they had a bit of trouble. They have had more than a bit of trouble. Oh my goodness. I think it was at one of the uh, cannabis economy events actually, where I saw one of the legislators go up there and say, well, 
it hasn't been a very smooth launch and the <laughs> snickering in the audience was like but she knows oh i mean God. becky knows and she's great about it actually yeah. and she's now actually visiting um at, you know having people come in and she's visiting and it's right. a, it's a complicated thing yeah to say the least yes. but it does seem like it is balancing out now i-502 and the whole bit it's it does, yeah. starting to get regular uh, but you were in there early so we it was not early, so it was not <laughs> And, you know, so the pricing was so ridiculous at one point yeah. that it, it, you know, it was hard for people to even go in and buy things. And then there wasn't enough material on the other side. So it, it, it was just so difficult. Right. It really was hard to grow there. But our licensees are launching recreational this month. So in Washington, in Washington. OK, great. So we're going to see the difference, yeah. you know, see the difference between the two markets and and how they're being Take, you know how they take hold and that is about the right time you know yeah. based on what has yeah. happened exactly yeah. all right so then oregon is december 1st no next no week. next week no next week we actually get there Vermont. on sunday okay. we get okay. there we start we start training on sunday so october 1st uh by the way they kick the doors open on uh, adult use and so it's medical and adult use That's and everything right. is going right no edibles until next year though for oregon until january 1 2016 yeah okay so um we're just launching medical next week understood and so take us through kind of some of the training that you do mm. well thomas is the alchemist so he'll take them through the training process for manufacturing okay yeah, blending the blending the teas we do most of it at our warehouse but there's some last minute or you know things that need to go in <coughs> it's fresh uh -huh. of raw ingredients raw uninfused ingredients. obviously uh -huh. yeah, all the infusion has to happen within that state with their licensed you know cultivated product right that has to be lab tested twice at least, so we know what we're working with with milligrams, mm -hmm. either a sugar or a, a raw CO2, mm -hmm. so that we know how to dose. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that will. So I mean, our yeah, it's. So then we actually then we have to make a cup, uh -huh. and then t test it again, so that we know that homogeneity is happening as well as FSC with our suggested, you know, our ballpark dosage. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be over. Yeah, ballpark is within how many milligrams? Uh, you want to get it within five or two. Right. Three. You want to get it right there. Yeah. On I mean, adult use, you you need to get it right there. On medical, five or two is not really going to be that. Right. That you just big don't want deal. it over. All right. But hey, when you're dealing with ten milligrams, it's got to be close to ten. Yeah, sure. Because ten, you can't be given a five. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be right. Your it's customer's going to be. Gonna be it's got to be right. It's got to be consistent, and it can't be over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Most importantly, because the whole batch gets destroyed. Indeed. <laughs> and, and you know, once Wall Street, once the Feds reschedule, and Wall Street's a little bit more comfortable, then yeah. we can have pharmaceutical uh, the tools that are already out there in other industries. Right. We can just have the backing to get them in our industry. Mm -hmm. As far as consistency, as far as testing, as far yeah, as all that, it's already there. It's yeah. just. You know, it's just our industry's like yeah. two steps forward, yeah. one step back dance. Sure. And, you know, that has to do with the fact that we're creating uh, the next great American industry yeah. uh, in real time, yeah, you know, exactly. like uh, month by month, uh, yeah. you know. Um, all right. So or uh, Oregon uh, coming uh, next week. Next week. Uh, Vermont is the December 1st one. Yeah. Second. Yes. Second. The second of December. We second start of December. Training there. Yeah. Okay. So Thomas does the manufacturing in the night. I cover all the sales and marketing training. Excellent. For your staff. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Nevada is when? Hopefully before gonna, the end of the year. Yeah, we're going to tour their. We we signed with them a year ago, and they started from scratch. Yeah. The build out, the uh, the you know planting, the all of it, and uh, so what we're going to do this week, we're going to see their year's progress, mm -hmm. and their first crop. Most of, most growers are. Most like you know, most folks are going to flower most of their product at first, just to recoup some costs. Sure. Yeah. But at the same time, I think we're they set a certain percentage of oil for extracting mm -hmm. and infusing, mm -hmm. and so their blend isn't going to be small, but it's not going to be Vegas large. Like I think by next year, a Vegas as large, it will be yeah. exactly yeah. right. It's, it's, it's well, a, they got to take the first step first. Yeah. No, exactly. It's a, it's, a, yeah. it's a pretty large. It's uh two. It's like um, 12,000 units. Which oh, is wow. Not. Okay. All right. That's decent. Yeah. Um, and let's see. Let's see if, you know, we're still, it's a medical deal. Indeed. But, you know, I'll tell you what, I mean, I could 
go for a little bad hat right now. <laughs> <laughs> I just, we, you t- just to, to, to set the scene there, Thomas just kind of looked out the window and then said what he said. Okay, so how how far how far are we from from California? It's on the map, and, and Illinois and Hawaii and, and Maryland. Okay. Sounds like you guys are working on. Tell those. you what, about yeah. five years ago, we did uh, released in California, right? And we did not know what we were doing. Okay, and we had an out. We had a, Cali- a Lake Tahoe girl, San Francisco girl. I forget where she was. She was San Francisco. And, mm-hmm. she, and she, we got, we got robbed. She took all our product. Yeah. She didn't deliver to the customers. Pissed off all the big clients. Awesome. And, Harborside. And everybody that counts. Pissed off. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Every, so we we'll looked like we mm-hmm. looked like dirt. Yeah. So we said we were not going to launch until we really had the right people. Right. Yeah. And so yeah, we already had launched in California five years ago. It just we had no idea. Yeah. We had no idea actually that orders were going to be so big. Sure. Yeah, they were huge. Well, they're moving a lot of product. Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So okay. So we then we never knew what happened to her. She never. She just disappeared. I don't know if she died. It's amazing. Or she, <laughs> so twenty is within twenty sixteen. Is that the goal, or is it Q one or Q three? California. Or, yeah. We'll see. We've come here. Okay. Because, uh, so we're on the uh, yeah, lookout. We've got some meetings this week, okay. so we're we're trying to hook things some things up. All right. Hook a row up. I got gotcha. you. I'll tell you what, we, it's kind of like the date. We've always, it's always the blind date in California. Yeah. We meet up and start making out. And then, <laughs> you know, you're like, whoa, yeah, you know, man, that breath stung. <laughs> so hopefully yeah. we'll get some Listerine in on this one. Or, there we go. I don't know what to tell you. We have some good people in line and they have the infrastructure and they're, they're compliant and they're, it's not the cowboy thing, yeah. you know. Right. California is still crime on crime, and so we're a little reticent to get involved with a situation that's not regulated, uh-huh. because we can lose a lot. It costs yeah. a lot of money to set up and get going, and we just don't want to be somebody walking off again. Yeah, and it is, but as it's going to be 2016, you know, six weeks or something. So what? And it's going to go recreation, and so we're we're going to posture ourselves. So I'm looking at spring. You'll be there when you need to be there, basically. With the right people. Indeed. All right. So so three final questions. And what we'll do is we'll give Jill the first one. We'll give Thomas the second one. And then you'll both answer the third one if you don't mind. Okay. The first question is, what has most surprised you in cannabis? That's the one for Jill. What has most surprised you in life is the one for Thomas. And then both of you, if you don't mind, will answer uh, the question of, on the soundtrack of your life, please name one song, one track. So... Jill St. Thomas, what has most surprised you in cannabis? I think the thing that's most surprised me yeah. about this industry is the, and, you know, without being a hippie about this whole thing, is the camaraderie that you do feel between the companies and the people that are in the industry. Yeah. And I, I think that that's because it's been so difficult. You know, we've been on the firing range and people have their guns pointed at us. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of been like a last man standing type of an attitude. Mm. And we've seen a lot of really good people go by the wayside. Mm. And so the people that are in the industry and have been in the industry for a long time, there's definitely a bond between us. You know, we may not be friends. We may be adversaries. We may even be competitors, Mm. but there's still a bond. And a respect. And a respect. And you feel that. You feel that, I think, at your events. Mm -hmm. A great deal, and yeah. I, that's why I enjoy them. And um, that's surprising. I mean, after being in the music industry, that's certainly very surprising. So that's, <laughs> not, that's not probably as much, the most surprising thing for me. Not as much camaraderie in the uh, music industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding, right? <laughs> but yeah, that's that's what I think. That's 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 been the most surprising for me. Okay, Thomas, what has most surprised you in life? I don't know, just I'm here. That I'm just here. Yeah. It's completely bizarre, right? <laughs> like the whole thing is just yeah. bizarre. <laughs> I'm with you there. <laughs> just a light wave passing through. All right. Months, right. Yeah. I'll, I'll take that answer. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So soundtrack of your life, Jill first, Thomas second. What song uh, must be there on the soundtrack? True love travels on a gravel road. I know you know this song. Wait. It's what? Sam Cook. Sam Cook. There you go. It's Sam Cook. Oh, man. Uh, see, that's somebody that could sing. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. my goodness. And it's true. I mean, that's a, that's a really good point, right? Because it, whether it's true love between two people yeah. or true love in something that you love to do and you're willing to 
remortgage the house and sell the cars and hawk all your gold because you believe what you're doing is the right thing. Yeah. And that's true love as well, yeah. right? So I think that fits in our in our ringtones. Uh, beat that, Thomas. <laughs> About gold digger. <laughs> Goldfinger. Gold gold finger. <laughs> no, no gold oh. There you go. Goldfinger. I mean, either way, I feel like. That's you know? Which finger? <laughs> <laughs> Are you, you going with either one of those? That's I'm fun. More, I'm more like a John Cage kind of guy, just silence. You know? <laughs> I like occasional bird tweet or a distant, you know, wind chime. Okay. Hey, you know, when I got into Vegas today, I'm like, I love car horns. Do you? <laughs> like the 20s or, live, or you know? the any any one right now, you're saying? Any any of the horns will do. Well, hey, you know, we live out on a, well, we're not doing the Mad Hatter. We're either on a, a ranch or huh. we're on the ocean. And so to hear an urban thing, yep. it's pretty, Music pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm a pop song guy. I, I keep up with my, my daughter, Electro. You know. Whatever she listens to, you know, hey, I'm copping out. I don't have it. I got Electra, give us a song. Really what, what's Katie your favorite Perry song right, right now? now? Katy Perry, yeah. yeah. Is that Katy Perry? Is that a big one? Which, which is who? That's Katy Diamond? Katy Perry? No. Rihanna. Oh, it's Rihanna. Of course it's Rihanna. Okay. Perfect. Thank you uh, really for the addition. Dish. Jill, Thomas, thanks so much. Thank and, you, uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing. We'll see you in all these states pretty soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. All right. You too. Jill and Thomas from Mad Hatter. Mad Hatter Coffee and Teas, as uh, discussed, available in uh, Colorado and uh, Washington and uh, Oregon uh, as of uh, next week. This is November uh, 11th. This is Happy Veterans Day, by the way, in retrospect. Uh, Vermont coming soon, Nevada coming soon, and then uh, California, Illinois. Hawaii, uh, etc.